Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be here in Toulouse. I've actually been here a couple times. I love this city. Uh, my name is Matt Carney. I'm a biomechatronics engineer. I'm trained as a mechanical design engineer, uh, and I do, I've worked on, I'm actually from California, from the Bay Area, and I've had the opportunity to work on a bunch of projects, um, everything from humanoid robotics to implanted medical devices and energy systems. And biomechatronics kind of brings all of that together. So I work for this fellow. This is Hugh Hare. He's a trans bilateral transtibial amputee, uh, and this comes from a mountaineering accident he had when he was in high school. And he's set up this lab, and he's, and what you what you can see here is he's sitting here, and he's got two robot legs attached to him. And that's something I want us to kind of think about as we go forward. Is like, what is the robot? He's got these these robotic systems attached to his legs, but he has no way to talk with them at the moment. They're just autonomous systems that are sensing the environment as he walks around. They're trying to figure out what to do next. Uh, are, is he stepping up a stair? Is he going down an incline? What is he doing, and how should it act? So what we do in our group is we really focus on how should these things act. And we try to bring the body and the machine together and use bio biology as inspiration for how we develop our systems. So going into that, we're, the way we work in our group is we're kind of split into three main areas. We do uh, the human-machine interface, which is the neural control systems. We do uh, soft tissue biomechanics to help us understand the mechanical interface. So that's how we actually hook those uh, robotic devices onto his legs. Uh, and then, of course, we get into the hardware itself. And that's kind of my specialty, is the hardware side of things. And ultimately, we also look into how we tie all that together in control systems so all these different subsystems can work together. So I should, I should have warned you, uh, a couple of these slides are a little bit graphic. So what I'm going to do is just kind of explain what, what this is right now. So traditional uh, amputation hasn't actually changed in something like 150 years. Uh, if, you, if you need to go through this process, what ends up happening is your, uh, and I'm going to focus mostly on the leg, um, your leg is cut and the bone is cut at a certain point and then the soft tissue is kind of folded up and bound together, uh, mostly so that it fits well into a socket so that you can actually have a device attached to you. The problem is this is de designed 150 years ago and you've been hearing all morning how things are changing so rapidly. It doesn't allow for a, a, a human machine interface to actually work. So what we're doing in our group is we're actually saying, OK, well, we want to get signals from the body. We can't do it very well with the traditional way. So let's just rethink things and change the way we go about it. And what we're doing is something called an AMI, an agonist antagonistic myoneural interface. This allows us to actually change the entire way we do the amputation so we can preserve the muscle leash, uh, or the nerve leash and the muscle bodies. So um, I guess why don't I step forward and just show you what we're doing with it. So this is actually the first human patient to be working with this system. And what you can see is uh, the two leg, he has uh, an intact leg and an amputated leg. And he's performing the same motion in both legs. And what you're seeing is you're getting these really nice, clean signals for dorsiflexion, which is what he's doing right now, uh, inversion, eversion, and, power and plantar flexion. If you were to do this on a, normal, on a traditional amputee, you can get some of these signals, but it's a much more mixed uh, set of signals. It's hard to differentiate what's actually happening. So, so what that actually means is this is actually a paper that was just recently published uh, talking about what we're doing. So we are actually taking, so I don't know if you're familiar with this. So, and this is new to me. So you're, you're, You've probably heard that your nervous system is electrical, right? You have all kinds of electrical stimulations, potassium passing through synapses. Uh, you actually have a wiring harness in your body. So for every muscle that goes down, so say your gastrocnemius or your soleus, there's actually one wire that comes all the way down from your brain through your spinal column all the way down to that muscle. It's called the nerve leash. And it then distributes out into the rest of your muscles. And, and you get recruitment, which causes all your muscles to start to kick into gear. So some process. Some ways of looking at this uh, is to try to hook into that nerve leash somewhere along the way or even up in the brain. The, the technique we're going after is saying, in certain circumstances, we don't have to sever everything. If the traumatic injury has mostly been to uh, the bone and structure. What we can do is we can actually preserve that wiring harness and actually keep that nerve leash that's attached to the muscles and just take that section of muscle that still has the wiring on it and just move it away from the, the, the area of amputation and reconnect it in a similar fashion to the way the muscle actually is working in your body. So you, you probably know muscles can only pull. So if I'm moving my leg, 
I have a pull pull actuators on either side that are causing my leg to move back and forth. And what that does is it allows you to both pull in one direction, but you may have co-contraction on the other side that causes an increased stiffness in your joint. So for different walking behaviors, you may have, you're going to have variable impedance or variable stiffness of your joint throughout that entire stage. And that, that co-contraction and that pulling on the other side also helps with proprioception. It helps you understand where your joint actually is. So what we're doing is we're preserving that ability to both pull and sense the pulling. And then we move it for, to another location in the body, and we hook up EMG signals, uh, EMG sensors to this. We can actually measure the muscle activation as well as we can put on the other side, we can put EMG that actually allows us to do functional electrical stimulation. So what we can do is we can actually get this one-to-one -one mapping between how you would normally be walking. We're sensing those muscles, because those muscles are still the same muscles. They still have all the same wires going up into your brain. You can walk on those. We can read those signals. We can use that to then control the robot. And then we can actually feed signals back to that other antagonistic muscle. So you can then sense where that uh, the, the position and the force that's in that robot. So we start to actually break down the barriers between the human and machine. And so you, you're no longer, like in that previous picture, you see Hugh is sitting there. He's basically on stilts. He's walking on these super fancy autonomous robotic stilts. Now what we're able to do with this new amputation technique is that we can actually bring the human into the loop. Speaking of that, so that, that, in that case, the human is working with the robotic hardware. But there's another sense. This is also a little bit graphic here. Uh, this is getting into optogenetics. So in some cases, you still have all of the hardware. You just can't talk with the hardware, meaning, say, you're paralyzed. So what we're doing now is this, uh, this is part of our neural group. We're actually, we're actually genetically engineering viruses to infect the nerve tissue in certain muscles. And it, it actually causes a reaction to light. And it actually causes a contraction of the muscles so that you can actually have, uh, you can have full control forward and backward of your muscle body. So you, could, you, so you can imagine a future where we actually have, where paralyzed patients actually get genetically modified uh, nerve tissue or viruses that, are infect, that infect their nerve tissue that allow them to then be controlled by light. So we can have a, con a computer controller that's shining controlled light signals onto your body and causing you to be able to, to walk again. So that's pretty crazy, right? I think that's probably the, the, the most insane thing I've seen. Um, but it, then there, we still we have to step back and get back to the real thing is, how do we, if for, we were talking about amputation as opposed to paralysis, how do we actually interact with the, the mechanical hardware? Here, what you have here is you have a, uh, uh, you can see Hugh's residual limb there in, attached to a socket. And it's basically like wearing clogs all day long. Here you have your body that has both a mixture of hard and soft tissue on it, and you're cramming that into a rigid socket. Usually these things are made out of carbon fiber, so it's very rigid and, and stiff. And you need that because you need to transfer load. There's a lot of load from walking around. You have these huge forces. The problem is that it's this hard piece, and your body's this hard and soft piece, and you don't actually, and, and you don't actually have a good uh, balance of these hard and soft zones, and so that can lead to uh, sores, it can lead to um, all kinds of complications. So what we're doing is we're actually taking, uh, this is actually all open source software that uh, Kevin Mormon's been building. We take MRI data, we segment it to separate out the hard and soft tissues, and then we create numerical simulations that simulate the uh, nonlinear viscoelastic behavior of your soft tissue and how it's actually creating these buoyant forces that hold your body and hold your bone in place inside the socket. And then we modulate the stiffness of the, the socket itself so that we can have this, varying, this spatially varying compliance of the socket to redistribute the load so that when you're wearing it, you have a more comfortable experience as your body is changing throughout the day. And we're doing this both with additive manufacturing through materials as well as geometry. So that brings us to the hardware. So this is the stuff I, I really like to get into. So, uh, on the right, you see a knee. This is actually a clutched series elastic actuator. So it's making use of uh, series springs to mimic the behavior of your tendons. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And on the left is a two degree of freedom uh, powered ankle. And so this allows you to have both powered plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, as well as eversion and inversion, which is twitching, uh, turning your, leg, your foot inside and out. And so you say, why, well, why do we want all these degrees of freedom? As it is, on, you can walk around on a passive device pretty easily. You can still get around. 
Well, having this enhanced uh, mobility actually allows you to have more stability in your walking. It also allows you to have greater personalization with your gait, which is something that I think we're hearing a little bit through some of the other talks is personalization is actually a really important part of this. Like, sure, you can get by on just walking on a passive leg, but there are, there are certain situations where that doesn't actually work out. And then we go into uh, more on the rehabilitation side of things. So, and I'll, st I'll get back to the actual hardware stuff in a bit. So we're also building exoskeleton simulators. So this is, so the exoskeleton, you've probably heard a lot about these days, is it's, uh, it's used for rehabilitation so you can learn how to walk again. It's also used for augmentation so that you can carry more weight around or you can run faster. Well, there's only been one or two of these devices that have actually been found to cost you less metabolic energy than to wear than not wearing the thing. So that means, basically means the like, joints don't necessarily align up. There's all this added mass from carrying around this system. It ends up costing you more to actually wear the thing. So we're building simulators now that help us con provide controlled in torque inputs throughout the entire walking cycle at different joints at different times so we can really start to experiment and understand how we can build these things so that they can actually be more efficient to wear. And we do all of this the way we apply all these things. I like to show this off mostly because this is the coolest point in my life when I got to play with a humanoid robot that I had to uh, take part in building. But what it's demonstrating is force control. So this is at Mecha Robotics a number of years ago. Uh, we were using series elastic actuators to do force control. And force control is really important for human-machine interaction. Anytime you have uh, a dynamic interaction between uh, a machine and a human, you need to be able to control it by force, not position, meaning you only use so much force to get to a certain position when you're trying to go through your trajectories. We also use these series elastic actuators uh, in locomotion systems because they mimic biology. Just like your, your Achilles tendon is, is actually just a gigantic spring, when you're walking, you're loading it up, and it releases when you do power plantar flexion when you're stepping forward. These series elastic actuators were originally developed just to measure force, but then it was realized that they are actually really important for saving, storing energy and allowing you to release it again so you can get more power output um, from your system, as well as also uh, decoupling the inertia of your drivetrain and your uh, output end effector. So the other thing we can do is we, we take all those systems and then we can model the dynamics of the system. This is a robot I built for, actually for a class a couple years ago. Uh, there's one motor in the middle of it. You see right there in the center, you'll see in just a moment, it's going to start to kick in. What we're doing here is that motor doesn't have enough power to actually swing up and get all the way around. But we, using uh, the dynamics of the system, we can actually model the energy flow of the system, and we can just build up enough energy that we can then get all the way around. <laughs> this is kind of a ridiculous robot. But the, the point is, is that you can actually model dynamics and take advantage of the energy flow of a system. So what I'm doing is I take a pile of math that, that models out the mechanical and electrical behavior of the actuator, so that's the springs, the gear ratios, uh, the, any linkage geometry that might be in there, and the electric dynamics of the system, and I build, a, a, build a, uh, a model of all those different systems working. And then I take user data, so I take walking data from uh, any one person, or ideally we would have a, a giant data set that it could be used internationally. Uh, and I think this is something Eddie might be able to talk about a little bit. And we take that data and we feed that in. And then we run an optimization. We just search. We just try a bunch of different variables. And we see how changing the stiffness or the spring ratio or any of these other terms actually helps us. Uh, we, we can change all these different things. And we see what is the, for instance, lowest energy uh, configuration. So what requires the least amount of energy to walk a certain way. We take all that stuff, and it spits out uh, design parameters that I can then feed into my parametric modeler to actually design the, the hardware itself. So that tells me like the spring stiffness, the gear ratio, all these things. And I'm actively working on this right now. Unfortunately, I can't show you what's happening right now, but we're building a full new leg system, uh, which is going to be pretty exciting. And finally, the point of all of this, for, particularly from the hardware side of things, is that you want, I think you want to have personalization. Like if we build one piece of hardware for one person, say it's for a 90 kilogram person who's walking around, or a 100 kilogram person, that's going to be a big leg because it needs to provide a lot of power. But if you're, say, a 60 kilogram person, you don't want to carry around this giant thing because all of a sudden you're going to be carrying this huge piece of weight around. And you're kind of going to be limping around. So by by taking really taking a step back and looking at what all the 
what all the underlying characteristics are of these systems, having an overall architecture that we can then parametrically model, um, we can take this, this user data, feed it in, and spit out a design that's specific to you. And we can also take the controller and tune that controller to actually allow you to be your own person. So we build something called a neuro, uh, reflexive neuromuscular controller that actually uh, models all the nonlinear behavior of the, your muscle tendon units and uses that to basically give you more torque as you're walking. And those are, there's parameters in there. And we can take those parameters and we can tune them and we can let the user tune them so that they can then become personalized. So finally, I just want to say this is all based on work that's done by a lot of different people. I focus on the hardware myself. Um, but there's a lot of us that are working on these things. And there's also, the, what we're doing at MIT is, is crazy, right? It's this, this super high-tech stuff. It's pushing the limits of what technology can do. But it doesn't necessarily mean that every person in the world is going to be able to use one of these things. Our, our job, we, the way we see this, our job is to inspire and, to, and find out what is, what is actually possible with all the technology that we're developing. At the same time, to maximize your impact, you need to understand what do people really need and what's good for them to use. And I think Christoph is going to talk about this a little bit later, is how do we maximize that value? So I just want to leave you all with thinking, you know, we're developing a technology, but ultimately for that technology to be, to be uh, used by people, we need, people to, we need our insurance agencies and we need uh, people around us to understand what is the value of actually providing this, this type of personalization to our users. So with that, I want to thank you. And uh, I think Eddie is going to be coming up to, to follow up with that. Thanks.